In this video, we'll look at some of our first applications of definite integrals beyond merely finding the area between a curve and the x-axis. Here we have the graph of two functions, a parabola, f of x equals 4 minus x squared, and a line, g of x equals x plus 2. I want to find the area between these curves. Notice that if we find the integral of the bottom function, g of x, the blue function, we'd get the area of this triangle. If we find the integral of the red function, the parabola, between these two points, we would get the sum of the areas of the purple region and the gray region. And so if we take the area underneath the red curve minus the area underneath the blue curve, we would get the area between the curves that we want. One thing we have to do is figure out our starting and stopping points for our integrals. It appears from the graph that those are where x equals 2 and x equals 1, but in general we need to solve for these algebraically. Our f of x function is 4 minus x squared, and our g of x function is x plus 2. We want them to have the same inputs and the same outputs at these points of intersection. So we set the outputs equal to each other. And it turns out we can easily factor this polynomial and see that x must be negative 2 or x must be 1. So we can take the area under the top curve, 4 minus x squared, we integrate that from negative 2 to 1, and then we subtract the area under the g of x function, and we integrate that from negative 2 to 1 as well. Before we begin integrating, notice that I could combine these as a single integral. And for my integrand, I would end up with the top function minus the bottom function. Continuing here, we would get the integral from negative 2 to 1 of 4 minus 2 is 2 minus x squared minus x dx. Finding an antiderivative, we get 2x minus one-third x cubed minus one-half x squared evaluated from negative two to one. When I plug in one, I get two minus one-third minus one-half. Then I subtract. I keep both of these things in brackets so I can distribute this minus sign. When I plug in negative two, I get negative four. Plugging in negative two here, I get negative eight times negative one-third, so plus eight-thirds and then plugging in negative 2 yields negative 2 squared, that's 4 times negative 1 half is minus 2. Simplifying, I get 2 minus minus 4 would be 6, minus minus 2 would be 8. Then I have minus 1 third minus 8 thirds, that's minus 9 thirds or minus 3, and finally minus 1 half. That gives me 4 and a half or 4.5 as the area. We can see from our graph that this purple shaded region is enclosed in a rectangle of base 3 and height 4, which is 12. It looks like the area of the purple shaded region is less than half of the area of the rectangle, which would be 6, and so 4.5 seems like a reasonable answer. We could take another approach to finding this area. Let's partition our interval from negative 2 to 1 into several pieces. And on each interval of the partition, let's build a midpoint rectangle. The area of each rectangle would be the top value minus the bottom value times the width. So in general, we'd have for the area of our rectangles, the top value at our chosen point minus the bottom function at our chosen point. I'm going to call that chosen point CK for the kth interval and then I would multiply by the width of each interval. In our problem, we have an interval of length 3 that we divide up into n pieces. So this becomes 3 over n. This is our delta x. Then we add up the areas of those rectangles, and we let the number of rectangles increase, and as we do, the sum of the areas of those rectangles should be close to the area we want. This sum is a Riemann sum, and its limit is the integral of the function 
f of x minus g of x. This is our delta x, it becomes a dx, and we're integrating over the interval from negative 2 to 1. So we can use this idea to, in general, set up an integral of the top function minus the bottom function to find the area between the two curves. Sometimes we have a slightly more complicated situation. Here we have a green curve, a green function, and a red function. These functions intersect in three places, and if we want to find the area of the regions enclosed between those two curves, we have an issue here because on the first part of this interval, the green function is the top function, whereas on the second part of the interval, the red function is the top function. So we'll need to split this into two pieces. It appears that this point where we want to split things is at x equals 3, but we should verify that that works. In fact, we need to find all three of these points here where the curves intersect. In this problem, one function is f of x equals x cubed minus 9x squared plus 23x minus 11. The other function is g of x equals x plus 1. We want to set these things equal to each other. This means we want to solve the equation x cubed minus 9x squared plus 22x minus 12 equals 0. Cubic equations are not nearly as easy to solve as quadratic equations, but we think that x equals 3 should solve this equation. That means that we think x minus 3 should be a factor here. Well, we probably need an x squared so that we get x times x squared equals x cubed, and we probably need over here a plus 4 so that negative 3 times 4 gives us negative 12. The question is, what should go in the middle? We could use synthetic division or long division of polynomials here, but let's see if we could guess and check. I need negative 9x squared, and I have a negative 3x squared here. So I need negative 6 more x squareds, so that probably means I need a negative 6x right there, and we can double check that this works. Now I need to factor this polynomial. Doesn't look like it factors quite so easily, but I know that I'm looking for places where x squared minus 6x plus 4 equals 0, so we can use the quadratic formula and simplify this to get 3 plus or minus the square root of 5. This point should be where x equals 3 minus square root of 5, and this point should be where x equals 3 plus square root of 5. On my first interval, I'm going to take the green function, the cubic polynomial, minus the red function, the linear function. So to set up my integral to find the area here, I would take the integral from 3 minus the square root of 5 up to 3 of the top function, which was x cubed minus 9x squared plus 23x minus 11, and then minus the bottom function, x plus 1, and then dx. Then I want to add to that the integral from 3 to 3 plus root 5, and on this second piece, I want the linear function on top and the cubic function on the bottom. Now we just have to work out both of these integrals. If we simplify these integrands, we just get a polynomial in each case. It shouldn't be too difficult to find an antiderivative. Then we plug in these values. That might get a little bit messier. We add the results together, and we get our area. I'll leave that to you. In general, the most difficult part of these problems is often an algebraic one, not a calculus problem solving these equations and finding these points of intersection. In some special cases, we can use algebra or solve trigonometric equations to find these intersection points. In general, we might need to use numerical methods, such as Newton's method, to solve the algebraic equations or approximate solutions to the algebraic equations to find our endpoints of integration. Now let's look at another problem. Here we have a constant function 3 between 2 and 6. We might ask ourselves, what's the average value of this function? Well, that's a pretty easy question to answer because the function's always 3, so its average value must be 3. Now let's look at a, this function. What's the average value of this linear function? It rises steadily from 2 to 4, so we might think that a reasonable answer for the, finding the average value would be that it's 3. And in fact, that will be the case, but we need to define this more carefully. Notice here that the area under my linear function 
is exactly the same thing as the area under my constant function. That if I just pretended this linear function always had a height of 3 and integrated it, I would get exactly the same value. Now let's consider this quadratic function. What is its average value? Well, I might want to find a constant function so that the area under this curve has the same area as my constant function does. What would be a reasonable value here? Probably not this, probably something below 2. I want this green area to be this equal to this purple area over here. It's kind of hard to tell exactly where that is, somewhere underneath 1.5 probably. So that's a geometric approach. If we follow that approach, we want the area under the curve, which would be the integral from 0 to 2 of the function x squared dx, we want that to be equal to the area underneath our constant function. I'm going to call the height of that constant function h, and then the base of our rectangle would be 2 minus 0. Now, I know that an antiderivative for x squared is 1 third x cubed, so evaluating this between 0 and 2, I get 8 thirds, and I want this to be equal to 2h, and that tells me that h is equal to 4 thirds, and that's right about where we thought visually the average value of the function should be. Now we've reasoned geometrically here, but remember integrals are actually defined in terms of Riemann sums. How in general do I find the average of several values? Suppose I have some quiz scores from a class. Maybe the first student got a 5, the next student got a 10, then an 8, then a 7, and then a 3. In order to find this average value, I would add up the quiz scores and divide by the number of quiz scores, 5. We'd like to do that for this function, except there's infinitely many different values of this function. However, we could choose some points in the domain of the function and look at the function values at those points and average these points instead. I would have my function evaluated at the first such point plus the function at the next point plus dot 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 plus the function at the nth point, and then I would divide these things by n. I could write this more compactly as the sum of f of each chosen point times 1 over n and let k run from 1 to n. Now, this is starting to look like a Riemann sum, except in a Riemann sum, this has to be delta x. And in our problem, our domain interval had length 2, and if we divide this interval into n pieces, each subinterval would have a length of 2 over n. What I would like to have here is the length of the interval, in our case 2, but in general b minus a over n. At this point, we're going to take some advice from my friend James Tanton. Check out his YouTube channel and his Twitter feed. His advice is, if there's something in life you want, make it happen, and then deal with the consequences. Is there something in life we want right now? We'd like there to be a B minus A there. So let's make it happen. Now, I've just multiplied this sum by B minus A. So I have to deal with the consequences. I have to divide this sum by B minus A so I don't change the value. Now, we do have a Riemann sum. And this Riemann sum will approach the integral from A to B of f of x dx, 1 over the length of the interval times the integral of the function from a to b. In fact, this is exactly what we did to find the average value of this function here. We took 1 over 2 minus 0 times the integral from 0 to 2 of x squared dx. So anytime we want to find the average value of a function, you can simply use this integral formula. Now another word for average is mean. We could call this the mean value of the function. And you might remember a mean value theorem from differential calculus. It turns out that these two things are related. Let's define our area function to be the integral from little a to x of f of t dt. And let's apply the mean value theorem from differential calculus to this function big A. It says that a of b minus a of little a all over b minus a must equal big A prime at some number C between A and B. That's what the mean value theorem says. But what is A prime of C? Well, 
a prime of x is just f of x. So this is f of c. What is a of b minus a of a? Well, a of little a is 0. a of little b is the integral that we're looking for here. So this says the integral from a to b of f of t dt over b minus a equals f of c. And this f of c is the average height of the function. This mean value theorem for integrals just says that there is some input c that gives us the output we want that's the average value of the function. In this video, we've seen how to find the area between two curves and the average value of a function. Soon we'll examine many more applications of the definite integral.